Hi, welcome. Well, it looks like we have attendees today from all over the world. Uh, looks like Australia, London, Canada, and all across the U.S. So thanks so much for being with us today as we continue to discuss topics around healthy sexuality and sex issues. My name is Kana Kassard. I'm one of the sex therapists here at Center for Healthy Sex. We're a sex therapy center located in Los Angeles, and we specialize in sex addiction, love addiction, and treatment of other sex and sexuality-related issues for men and women. Center for Healthy Sex today is excited to present Ready to Heal, Women Facing Addictive Love, Sex, and Relationships. This is presented to you today by Kelly McDaniel as a part of our Sex Expert webinar series. All of the webinars that we present today and in the past are going to be available on our YouTube channel, and you can find that at youtube.com forward slash center for healthy sex. So I want to highlight um, some of the services that we um, offer, and one of them is the online Skype classes. And this is a 12-week class series that is based on the book that Kelly wrote, Ready to Heal, and it's to help women who are struggling with sex and love addiction. Um, this is, it provides insight and education. So this is the book. Uh, this is Kelly's book. Uh, it's wonderful, and it, it, again, gave us the foundation and guidance that we could provide for women who are struggling with sex and love addiction issues but maybe aren't located in Los Angeles. So this is a way for them to get started on their recovery or continuing to work on their sex and love addictive issues. Um, we also offer an 11-day intensive for female sex and love addicts, and it's designed by our clinical director, with uh, Alexandra Katahakis, uh, with input from Kelly. And this is for women whose lives have become unmanageable due to um, sex or love addiction issues. And then also for the professionals in our audience, um, those of you who are working on working with and treating with women treating women who have sex and love issues, sex and love addiction issues, excuse me, um, we have um, the book that Alexandra Katahakis collaborate, collaborated with, Kelly and eight other professionals. It's called Making Advances, a Comprehensive Guide for Treating Female Sex and Love Addicts. It was published in 2012 and edited by Marnie Ferre. So today, Kelly McDaniel is joining us from Fredericksburg, Texas, where she maintains her private practice specializing in the treatment of adults and couples who are searching for greater meaning, peace, and connection in their lives. And her background also includes training as a certified sex addiction therapist with ITAP, Sue Johnson's certification as an emotionally focused therapist, Pia Melody's certification as a post-induction therapy trained therapist. She, Kelly is also an EMDR trained therapist and has a foundation in relational cultural theory. That is quite a background, Kelly. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, the book that she wrote, uh, it was published in 2008 and it was published by Gentle, Press, <laughs> Gentle Path Press and it was um, then in 2012, the second edition was expanded to include a chapter on Kelly McDaniel's Mother Hunger, which you're going to hear about more today. So thank you again for joining us, and I will hand it over to you, Kelly. Thanks again. Thanks for having me, and I just want to check to see if you can hear me okay. Hopefully you can, and if... Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you for the feedback. This is, this is kind of a new experience for me, speaking to a computer and hoping that um, my voice will reach who needs to hear this. Um, so first of all, I'd really like to thank Alex and, and Tom and Douglas and the Center uh, for Healthy Sex for inviting me to speak with you today, but even more so for being some of the largest supporters of Women in Recovery from Sex and Love Addiction and Ready to Heal. Um, such a need for the material to reach women in a way that can reduce some of the shame and stigma. And I think that Alex at the Center for Healthy Sex has really um, taken this movement where it needs to go. And I fully um, appreciate the mission of the Center for Healthy Sex. Uh, the mission is so lovely that... Um, 
at CHS, they're dedicated to treating adults, um, couples, individuals, um, in a very safe environment, using professional psychotherapy to reduce the shame, the guilt um, that surrounds anything that could get in the way of a healthy, vibrant, healthy sexual life. So it's a mission I feel very congruent with and I'm happy to be part of in any way that I can. So I'm imagining if you're here today to listen, to ask questions, to offer commentary, that you are either healing your own uh, addictive relationship with love and sex um, or you're in the profession of helping others heal or both. Um, and I welcome your input and your questions, comments, as um, I kind of don't uh, need necessarily to just hear myself talk. I'd love to hear from you. So with that said, um, I will go ahead and, and start with a little bit about Ready to Heal. And I, in the interest of our timing, I've condensed it to really focusing on talking about cultural influences that set women up for this addiction but also then moving into talking about mother hunger, which is the foundation um, relationally for why women may find themselves in addictive relationships over and over again. Um, so I'm going to see if I can switch the slides here. Um, some of you may be asking, although I imagine if you're part of this discussion, you're not asking this in a really big way, but how does this happen? Like how does love and sex become addictive? Since we're wired to be loving creatures, we're wired to be relational creatures, we are wired to um, enjoy romantic feelings and sexuality, how can it become addictive? And so the reason I wrote Ready to Heal is to add to the wonderful work that was already present in our field from Dr. Patrick Carnes um, to really expand a little bit about how unique this addiction would be for a woman whose brain is designed to be in connection, but then she finds that the connections are addictive. It's a, it's a horrible bind. Um, one of the things that sets women up for this addiction um, is isolation. And back in the 1970s, Dr. Jean Baker Miller out of the Wellesley Stone Center was talking about the devastating impact of isolation on an infant brain. And now we have all the wonderful neurobiological research and studying that's going on, Alex, which has been so wonderful in creating and integrating a neurobiological understanding to what we already know as clinicians. It's really validating what Jean Baker Miller was able to put forth back in the 70s before we had the research to back it, that, um, that psychological isolation is the most terrifying human experience that we have. And most of the women that I work with who are struggling with addictive relationships have known this isolation most of their life, in fact, experienced a terror before language was even on board. So we're talking about a primitive form of isolation that's terrifying because it basically means there's no caregiver that's safe. Um, so since we're going to be talking about this, I, I feel the need to say many of you are probably aware of this already if you're familiar with Ready to Heal, but this is not an easy topic and it can be a painful thing to listen to, especially if you've known this type of fear. So I would invite you, while you're listening, to be very gentle with yourself. Sometimes it helps if you hold your own hands or cross your feet, which helps integrate your right and left hemisphere a bit. Um, but if you feel triggered by something that I'm saying, um, that's really normal. And it can be difficult for me to talk about it as well. So um, be gentle with yourself, and if you need to take a break, you can do that because you can always go listen to this later on YouTube and you don't have to stay with it today. Okay. I love this quote. This is from a, a client that I worked with and I thought it was just so brilliant that I put it into Ready to Heal and I wanted to bring it in today. She said to me in session once, um, you know, it's one thing if I'm addicted to a man or sex. It's a whole other thing if it's because I'm lonely. That means I'm a total loser. And... I just thought she did such a great job of 
putting into words not only the fear that comes with being alone, but the shame. The word lonely makes us feel really defective, like something is very much wrong with us. Um, and this is wired in for reasons that are about our survival. Um, when we were more tribal and living in community, if we were left alone, that was, or if we were banished, that was how we were punished because survival was not going to happen. We are community based creatures. We need each other desperately, not just to thrive, but to survive. So if someone was banished from the community, it meant death. So touching in or naming loneliness is a really scary thing for humans to do. Um, so not only is this a disease that comes from isolation, which we'll be talking more about with mother hunger, but it's also a disease of, of cultural inheritance. Um, I think Dr. Christian Northrup does a really nice job in all of her literature of explaining how our culture gives girls the message that our bodies, our lives, our very femaleness demands an apology. Um, and this is the legacy of, of patriarchy, which is a culture that um, doesn't always appreciate, doesn't know how to make room for the strengths and the power that women offer and how necessary uh, what women have to offer, how necessary it is. And so instead, values such as independence, strength, um, testosterone-related um, attributes get, get priority. And um, as a result, women can grow up in a culture feeling deeply inferior for reasons that really don't make sense but are often eroticized. Um, this is a huge participating factor in how sex and love can become addictive. In fact, it's amazing to me that women can grow up in Western culture without some really addictive episode in her struggle to find a relationship. Um, and, and that's a reminder I want to just emphasize. I am really talking about Western uh, heterosexual Anglo mainstream America culture right now. And that's a pretty limiting perspective. Um, it was a jumping point for this book. And because I was working mostly from my own clinical studies as well as former studies in women's studies, I am aware that as, a, as an American and as a white woman, I needed to focus on what I'm comfortable with. Um, so Women of color, women that are living in other places in the world may or may not always identify with the cultural beliefs that Ready to Heal has addressed, but um, we'll still cover them with the awareness that that is a, a limited view. Um, Northrop also talks about how when one is wanting to heal an addiction, it can only occur if the internal belief system or assumptions um, that we unconsciously breathe in from our family and change. And this is where I felt it was important to look at what cultural messages women are breathing in simply by growing up in uh, mainstream America. Um, so even if a woman's from a, a family that's relatively healthy, it's pretty remarkable if she can navigate the cultural messages that she's going to get about her body and her sexuality without some form of uh, pain. So Dr. Carnes um, gave us these core beliefs um, in his early writing about sexual addiction that are common for all people struggling, men and women, with addictive love and sex. And I really, really think without these four beliefs, we'd still be floundering to even begin where do we change the brain so that this addiction has a chance to um, lose some power. So he came up with these four, and most of you would most likely have seen this, be very familiar with, I'm a bad, unworthy person. No one would love me as I am. I have to, if I have to rely on others to meet my needs, they won't be met. And sex is my most important need, which I find that is congruent with people who identify more as sexually addicted, or my most important sign of love, which I attribute more for people that are love addicted but might misuse sex because that is a sign of love, and I see this with most of the women that I treat, or my most terrifying need, and this I see coming up with sexual anorexic folks who are um, 
really struggling with any form of sexual information. So I added to his beliefs what I was finding coming up for the women um, that I work with consistently. And these four beliefs are what I also work to heal um, in addition to the other four. So women that are healing this addiction really have an additional cultural burden that they face that they must also kind of break out of this idea that you must be a good girl in order to be worthy of love, that if you are sexual in any way, you're a bad girl, but that you're not really a woman unless someone desires you sexually or romantically, and you must be sexual to be lovable. So those of you that are astutely paying attention um, have already figured out that to follow those four directives is not possible. So... There's no way to be uh, a good girl if being sexual is bad, but then be sexual if you want love. And these beliefs get transmitted to us through fairy tales. Um, And I I have so much fun with these images. And sometimes people say to me, really, why are you still talking about fairy tales? Haven't we kind of gotten past this? And my answer is no, we, we really haven't gotten past this. These images are wired into our brains and still getting remade beautifully uh, in 2015. These are images from the new movie, Cinderella. Um, It just came out and is a testimony to how strong these archetypal images of women are embedded in our culture. The idea is that um, women can be rescued and Prince Charming has the huge burden of rescuing What I find interesting, too, is that the Scarlet Letter, which was written in 1850, um, how applicable that still is today when we think of sex and love addiction. Because when a woman is considering approaching healing this addiction, she is branded. And that's really unfortunate because we saw, and most people have had some exposure to the Scarlet Letter, whether you had to read it in high school or you saw the movie, Um, that came out, I believe that was in 1995 with Demi Moore. Um, So you see how powerful a woman who is overtly sexual threatens a structure, a societal structure. It threatens the cultural belief that um, you're a good woman if if you're sexual. And so taking on the name Sex and Love Addiction is almost accepting a kind of brand. And I think that can sometimes be the hardest obstacle to recovery. Because really, without a name, we don't have a path. And we need a name, but nobody wants to be branded. Um, Anyway, I I like thinking about Bewitched in terms of this, too. Um, I grew up with Bewitched. I think others probably did as well. But it was always so interesting to me that she had this powerful magic and this huge capacity to really uh, make life pretty fabulous. But her husband always made sure that she couldn't use it. He didn't want to see it. He didn't want to know about it. But then, of course, when he got into a bind occasionally, it would be okay for her to use it. So in other words, if we look at her magic as a metaphor for sexuality, which is the core of who she is, her magic was the core of who she is, she had permission to use it when he would allow otherwise She would be punished for using it. She would have to do it secretively. And secrets are what breed addiction. That when we have to hide a part of ourselves, um, it's not accepted, and we find secretive ways to enjoy it, uh, we're on the road to having an addictive relationship with a part of ourselves. I love Charlotte Castle's work. I'm sure many of you are familiar with her work as well. Um, She wrote uh, Women's Sex and Addiction, which is one of the first radical books to dare touch this topic. Um, And in her book, she talks about how women have been taught to disconnect from sexual feelings, to hate them, to only secretly enjoy them, or to feel ashamed of them. And this is why I love the illustration of of Samantha uh, in Bewitched, because we get to watch what that does to her. So, wrap up a study of culture, Um, and I'll take some questions after this. So if you have anything, um, be thinking about what you might want to address regarding culture before we move into talking about mother hunger. 
But these messages that women receive that are conflicting set up a double bind. And a double bind is the most excruciating dilemma um, because it means either choice you make, you're going to be wrong. Um, It's really hard for a person to thrive sexually, passionately, creatively, when a deep core part of the self is going to be wrong if, if expressed. So an authentic expression of sexuality gets thwarted and twisted in a culture that doesn't really like women or objectifies their bodies, uses their sexuality for titillation or marketing purposes. Um, in a consumer culture like this, a woman will find all kinds of ways to understand her own body and her own sexuality that can be very destructive. And it, it always amazes me that um, women find a path toward loving themselves through all this. So a double bind, again, is a psychological impasse. And so if you've ever had this feeling of being immobilized, um, unable to make a decision or move in a direction that you would like to, chances are you're caught in a double bind. And I think it's really important for us to, to really have respect for this when women are facing healing in the very culture that has presented the double bind. So I'm going to pause, take a drink of water, and see if any of you have any questions before we talk a bit about mother hunger. Kelly, uh, this is Tom. We have a question from Deborah. She asks, at what age can we help girls change their cultural belief? We have lots of 12-year-olds in our church that are love addicted. Mm. Oh, yes, I think you would have lots of 12-year-olds that are love addicted. Um, Such a painful thing to see because this does start so young. um, And... I wish I had a really nice, tidy answer for that. I don't. Um, But I don't think it's ever really too early to begin helping girls formulate better or healthier ideas of what it looks like to be in a relationship and to be a woman. And sometimes there aren't any good images. And so sometimes it's about what we don't show them. Um, I have many clients who are mothers who are very careful about their televisions in the home. They're very careful about using fairy tales with their children. Um, As delightful as they can be, they really are passing along messages that are culturally damaging. Um, And I have not had the privilege of raising a daughter, but I have had the honor of raising a son. And I have seen how these cultural messages have been damaging for him as well. So I did protect him from fairy tales because what a lot of pressure on a young growing boy to think it's going to be his job to rescue and take care of a princess. Um, So we have a large cultural issue here. I don't think really there's a time when it's too young to start educating. However, as a mother, as a clinician, and as a teacher, I wish I had a really nice, tidy way to direct that process. I don't. My contribution is having these kinds of discussions and these kinds of books. Another book I really like for parents and for uh, 12-year-old girls is Reviving Ophelia. So many of you might know about that book. That's written by Mary Pfeiffer. It is one of the most brilliant resources for uh, people who are helping adolescents, for adolescents themselves, easy to read, um, very, very appropriate. So... We have a message from San Diego that the movie Brave brought the first self-sufficient woman that didn't need a man. Hmm. Thank you for that contribution. And Paul from Mississippi writes that it strikes me that a great deal, though certainly not all, of this applies to boys whose sexuality is shamed when they are prepubescent. I would definitely agree with that. And it's always been kind of a pleasure to me when men um, give me feedback that they've read my book and it actually helped them. I, I find that thrilling and validating because I do think culture, when, the, when culture determines our role, it takes us away from our authenticity, and that happens to men as well as women. So thank you for that 
for that comment. It looks like somebody's asking for the name of the book again, and I think that's Reviving Ophelia that Deborah may be referring to. Reviving Ophelia, Mary Pfeiffer. Great, and we have Tricia from Los Angeles who asks, who says she's in SLAA as an anorectic, and she's trying to figure out what constitutes healthy masturbation. Well, that's a great question, and a um, large question, I think, for many women who are in recovery, whether as love addicts, sex addicts, or anorexics. And so um, it's a bit beyond the scope of what I am prepared to cover today because I think that needs its own, <laughs> that really could use its own full hour. Um, but I do, I think that the 12-step programs are doing an excellent job with this issue. And the Center for Healthy, Healthy Sex, Alex and Tom, I and, and the team there, I think are really leading the way in helping us find a healthy way to integrate masturbation um, into a joyful, vibrant sexual life. But I don't really feel like an expert on that and wouldn't want to get too derailed today. But thank you for the question. It's so important. Can we have Jill from Sonora, California, who asks how can she interact with her 32-year-old daughter? The daughter is affected by the sex and love addiction of her dad and, and of her mom. Uh, the daughter's without someone special in her life for years, is anorectic to food and probably sex, is successful in her job in a major city. Um, it's painful and fear-filled for the mom to be around her when seeing what she does and doesn't eat. Oh, yeah. I bet that's very painful and really hard to witness. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you wrote in with that, and I'm sorry um, that your daughter is suffering, and I know that you're suffering watching that. So you're asking how to interact, and I think that's a, um, a really great question. I'm hoping that perhaps you have a good clinician that you're working with because this can bring up so much grief and loss, not feel safe to connect with your daughter. So I'm hoping you have someone you can work those deeper issues with, and I find that Al-Anon is also a really helpful 12-step resource in helping us connect with folks that might not really be able or available currently to connect. Thank you for your question. Okay, maybe one more question. We have Let's Serena go. from Mexico, and she writes, to be a woman has so many risks about sexuality. Women are asked to somehow embrace sexuality, but there are so many dangers, rape and unwanted pregnancy, in or outside of rape. Our bodies have a level of risk inside of them that isn't culturally addressed. Well, that is beautifully said, <laughs> Serena. Um, I agree with you 100%, and thank you so much for your comment. I, I don't know that there's really a question in that as much as there is an observation that is very real. Thank you. And we have Laura, Laura who uh, chimes in that she's sad, that Serena feels that being a woman has risks, and that's starting life with a strike against your existence. Well, it is sad, and it is a reality that being born a woman in many cultural uh, ways and different parts of our world is being born with a strike against your existence. And um, that's sad but also true. So it's something we'll, I think, be touching on a bit as we move ahead and discuss mother hunger, which in the interest of time, I think I should do that now because I think the discussion could even address some of what's being noticed right here. Um, does that feel okay, Tom, to move on? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Uh, and again, I just want to offer a reminder that this discussion about mother hunger is not easy to listen to. Um, so take care of yourself as you are here with me. Okay. Um, when I started working uh, clinically and finding the underpinning for love and sex addiction kept coming back to this, this exquisite 
loneliness. And oftentimes the loneliness seemed to be so primitive, so young, that um, obviously it went to attachment and whether or not there was an attachment figure that was safe. And I kept coming into regular contact with the hunger that goes with addictive love and sex, the cravings, the insatiable appetite, um, or the complete aversion. And this also felt like it needed a name, um, a name that would really do it justice so that there could be a pathway for understanding and hope. So that's where I came up with the term mother hunger. And that's probably not a full explanation, but I think it'll become more clear as I go through these slides. I want to just say that those of you that are mothers could find some of this discussion really unsettling if you didn't have this information when you were first a young mother. And those of you that um, did have this information and are practicing attachment parenting with your young children, bravo. Um, I think, you know, mothers have really been working against the grain to try to attach to their children when we've had books like Dr. Spock out there saying, let your baby cry it out in the crib. So a discussion of mother hunger can bring up all kinds of shame if you are a mother and you realize things that you wish you could do differently. Um, and I would really invite you to try to be gentle with yourself. This is not about blaming mothers. Um, this is purely about creating an understanding so that we can find a pathway to healing for women um, mothers and daughters. This discussion typically brings up grief. And I love Wayne Mueller's commentary and quote here. Um, I love it so much I'm just going to read it to kind of help us get ready to talk a little bit about mother hunger. We're terrified of the painful grief that is hot to the touch, sharp and piercing. So we keep moving faster and faster so we'll not feel how sad we are how much we have lost in this life. Strength, youthful playfulness, so many friends and lovers, dreams that did not come true, all that have passed away. When we stop even for a moment, we can feel the burning, the empty hole in our belly. So we keep moving, afraid the empty fire of loss will consume us. And if that's not the most brilliant description of addiction, I'm not sure what is, because addiction is a form of constant motion, constant hypervigilance, a state of hyperarousal, so that we don't have to feel this horror, this terrified small person inside who is so lonely and so sad and lost so much. I find this a validating quote as we move ahead and talk about what some of that grief is. It helps to understand the female brain. Um, so just in brief, a few comments about the female brain. Women are, are born wired for connection, and, and little boys are too. Um, and because we're all mammals, we need connection. Women have more areas in their brain that are designed for visual cues, verbal cues, sounds, smells, all that go toward making sure we understand who we are in connection with. And these are really heightened in the female brain um, for all kinds of hormonal and um, uh, reproductive reasons. So what happens to an infant girl is that she comes into the world really desperate and ready for connection. And if there's not a caregiver there, that can offer this capacity to be in connection in a safe way, her brain will become hijacked. Um, the neural pathways that are supposed to flourish and grow in the loving arms of a careful, attentive, present caregiver um, will not grow in the way that they need to for her to be able to then move on in the world with a sense of safety, security, and capacity to connect with other people. So I needed a name for this. Um, to help reduce the shame because so many women feel like, what is wrong with me? I'm defective. I, I just, I can't do this. And by offering an understanding that this happened in the arms or outside the arms of a mother um, has really helped women embrace a healing path. So understanding this mother wound is really about shame reduction. Um, sorry. 
I have a cat outside who really wants to bond with me right now. She hears me talking. Um, okay, so we want to understand the mother wound so we can reduce the shame around it. It's not about blaming women or mothers. And all mothers, it's good to remember and keep in mind, are products of the same cultural bind um, that their daughters are. Um, and I like this quote because I think it refers to what some of you have been talking about in, in questions. Um, a mother's victimization does not merely humiliate her. It mutilates her daughter. Daughter's watching her for clues as to what it means to be a woman. So like the traditional foot-bound Chinese woman, she passes on her affliction to her daughter. The mother's self-hatred and low expectations are binding rags for the psyche of the daughter. There's some myths in our culture about what it is to be a mother. But all mothers, because they're women, ought to know how to give perfect love. They're naturally sacrificial. They're free of all ambivalence about their children. That this is instinctual that all females are nurturing, so every woman should be a good mother and should love being a mother all the time, no matter what her child is like. There's a denial, culturally, of the complexity of being a mother, of the challenge it takes to meet a child in that child's language, not the mother's language, so that the child can bloom and blossom. And then to be able to do that across the different developmental life stages. So some mothers may have felt very confident with infants, but then lose confidence with teenagers, or vice versa, that there's really nothing that prepares us for the complexity of the developmental human brain. Um, there's also a myth that every mother loves each of her children equally. Um, and this is a really lovely idea. But the truth is some children are easier for some mothers, and some aren't. And so if you're lucky as a mom to have a child who really is a lot like you in her communication style and her way of being in the world, it makes your job much easier. But if not, if you have a child who really comes from a different grain than yours, it's very challenging to meet your child. Um, it's too bad we don't have more education about that so that mothers can think seriously about whether or not this is a spiritual journey that you would like to undertake. Um, so... What happens is somebody does decide to have a child who um, perhaps isn't aware of the complexity, um, and then the legacy for the daughter is really where I'm going to focus now, are grown women that are struggling with this early attachment that didn't happen uh, or happened in a way that was very painful, and then she's left with a template of painful early traumatic bonding that gets repeated with girlfriends, gets repeated with lovers. Um, what I have done in Ready to Heal just to simplify this issue is to somewhat look at it in binary terms of kind of the critical angry mother um, at one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is the suffocating mother, the mom who needs her child to be her friend because um, she hasn't developed enough of her inner world or her own social network, which is really hard to do when you're um, a woman in this culture. Then, of course, when we're talking about this, there are mothers that were absent, um, either completely physically absent because they died early or because they left. Um, so most of the research I have found that has actually helped me in writing Ready to Heal was from um, a journalist who wrote the book Motherless Daughters. Um, I think I have her number, her name here. It'd be really sad if I, oh there nope that's not it it'll come to me um, she did a study of daughters who lost their mothers to early death and what it was like for them in the world and I appreciate her work so much because um, she beautifully described my clients uh, clients who are struggling with sex and love addiction present as motherless daughters they are without a mother they have never had a guide they've never had a woman that they could admire and trust, who could guide them into what it would be, what it would be like to be a healthy woman. Um, important as we're talking about how this happens to look at. Thank you. 
I just got a comment from a colleague and dear friend, Cheryl Grant, uh, who's um, a beautiful therapist, who reminded me that is Hope Edelman's work. <laughs> Hope Edelman wrote the book Motherless Daughters. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, so um, because a daughter is born with such an exquisitely tuned brain and designed to connect, she can pick up and observe, observe emotional cues from her mother's nervous system. She integrates these into her own nervous system. So a mother's nervous system is the environment that a baby girl will take a bath in during her first two years and before she has language. So before she's even verbal, she's already making up her reality based on what her mother's reality is. This is called epigenetic imprinting. I find this such an empowering concept and terrifying concept. But I like to talk with um, the wonderful women that I work with and ask them if they can recall, and generally everyone can recall, what the conditions were for their mother during her pregnancy and the early part of their life. Was she happy? Was she frightened? Was she lonely? Was she scared about where her next meal is coming from? Was she addicted? Um, and this all can really inform where it could be hard to to know what, what happened to me, why am I like this, because a lot of it happened before language was on board, before the frontal lobes were working. Um, this was all getting administered into the limbic part of the brain and into the body. So the clients I work with were very lonely little girls that have learned to go through amazing psychological gymnastics to avoid the fact that they were lonely. <clears throat> so what this might look like are little girls that became experts at figuring out how to keep mom happy or try to or keep her safe or just try to keep her near or for some little girls how to get her away. Devastating when a little girl needs to learn how to create space from her mother, the very person that she needs, but that a lot, and it registers as more avoidant behavior, so we'll, we'll be getting into that. Um, I'm going to make sure we leave time for questions. So, so when I talk to groups of women, um, and I'm, I'm doing this more in workshop fashion, generally women who identify as sex and love addict, addicted women, sex and love addicts, are really aware of this concept of mother hunger. They feel a loss of their mother. They're sad. They've, they're regularly conscious of trying to connect with her and failing time and time again. But for a significant population of the women that I speak with and work with, uh, this isn't the case. There is no desire to connect with mom. Um, they don't remember ever really wanting to connect with her. Um, and so this can seem really tedious or boring or unnecessary as a part of healing. Um, I, I want to just kind of ex explain that this is a, a continuum. And just as women can sometimes be love addicted in a relationship or sex addicted in the next one, in one relationship, or you might be really aware of mother hunger in another one, um, you don't feel any need, any need for her. So... Both extremes can exist in the same soul. But I'm going to, for simply making this easier to digest, um, if a woman had a mother who was sometimes there for her, might have been seductive, might have been needy or funny, but often she was chaotic, intrusive, critical, oftentimes physically, emotionally abusive, this is going to create an, att an attachment style that's primarily anxious, vigilant. And daughters grow up repeating this love. Um, there's an attachment hunger, which feels like an emotional hoarding, almost like nobody could love you enough. No, no person, no friend, no romantic partner ever seems to have enough for you. Only round-the-clock attachment gives you the illusion that you're okay. In relationship, if your attachment style is primarily anxious, you can get really angry easily, sometimes feel really small and act very small sometimes get bigger than life and be really intimidating. Um, and it can be really confusing both for you and for the people that you're in relationship with. Some of you that are not um, identifying with this at all might feel more avoidantly attached and 
again, I want to remind you that anxious attachment, avoidant attachment is on a spectrum. We all have pieces of both, and I'm really simplifying this. So you may not find yourself in any of this description right now in a complete way, but you might identify with pieces of it. But for avoidantly attached women, their mothers were generally totally unavailable. Now, that can be in different forms. It's very insidious when an unavailable mother is actually overly available and suffocating. Um, so that what a daughter has to do to, to define herself from this suffocating presence is to so thoroughly pull away and shut down that she is without a mother, even though her mother's there and very hungry for her. Avoidant daughters tend to then define themselves, whether their mother was gone due to premature death or left her or suffocated her, through being very independent. These are very independent women, generally have excelled uh, professionally. They appear supremely confident, generally will not ask for help. But there's a deep, deep set belief for the avoidantly attached woman that she will be abandoned and that it's inevitable. So it's a lot easier for an avoidantly attached woman to find herself in an addictive relationship with pornography than it would be for an anxiously attached woman who's more interested in the regulatory process that happens brain to brain. Again, this is just a reminder that you can be shades of both. Um, if you do a timeline with your therapist um, or your sponsor, you're going to find that you have a dominant attachment pattern um, based on who you find yourself in relationship with. I like to differentiate that attachment style is not the same thing as mother hunger. That whether you're avoidantly primarily attached or anxiously attached, there's mother hunger for both. So even if you don't feel it, doesn't mean it's there because mother hunger is another way that we're identifying an attachment disorder that um, really hijacked an early brain and set the brain up to use love and sex for survival and it became addictive and secretive. So all women who present with a form of addicted love and sex have some piece of mother hunger. Some are going to be really eager to address this and others won't be. Um, but it will be necessary to take a look at it for relationships to work well. Let's say just a word about healing mother hunger since I've talked about it. It would be nice to know there is a way to heal it. Um, and this will be brief so that I can have some time for questions. But it's going to involve grieving the mother that you never had, psychologically separating from the one that you do if she's still around, for some people, this involves an actual temporary separation that can look a lot like a therapeutic divorce or separation from a romantic partner um, where there's a timeout with boundaries and it can feel like withdrawal. Uh, it's, it's really terrible. Um, but after a period of withdrawal from a mother who has caused pain, um, there can then be a rebuilding into a civil connection that the daughter herself will define. Um, some mothers will never tolerate this form of civil connection, so sometimes divorce is, in, is necessary between a mother and a daughter. Uh, it's really not a solution as much as it is a strategy for survival. If a daughter needs to divorce her mother, this is really, really terribly sad. It only offers partial healing, and there is a permanent hole that is left for the daughter. But it's good to remember that it's divorcing the mother's ability, inability to be loving. It's not divorcing the need for the mother. The need doesn't go away. Um, so every is about finding replacement mothers who can do the job that you're working so hard to do in recovery, which is to heal your brain and find relationships that nourish you. Okay. I am imagining all of you have ambivalent feelings about Angelina Jolie, but I must say, I am so thrilled with her <laughs> remake of the Sleeping Beauty story because if you're familiar at all with Sleeping Beauty, you know that it's the myth of love's first kiss will wake the sleeping princess and bring her back to life from the horrible curse. And what I love that Jolie did with this is that it wasn't Prince Charming's kiss that woke up Aurora. It was Maleficent's kiss that woke up Aurora. Maleficent in Sleeping Beauty 
is, in fact, the fairy godmother. She's the replacement mother since Aurora lost her mother early to death. And Aurora always felt Maleficent's presence as a benevolent presence, a kind presence. And in spite of herself, Maleficent, Angelina's character, fell in love with Aurora, loved her, mothered her, and desperately wanted to reverse the curse and was able to do so by kissing her. This is such a radical, wonderful twist on the fairy tale that if I've ever been glad we still have them, (laughs) Angelina makes me want to celebrate. Um, So, like Aurora did with Maleficent's character, she created an internal mother because she had lost her own. She created a celestial mother. That term actually comes from a client once who really, really grappled with this concept and created for step two, rather than a patriarchal god of her choice, she created a celestial mother for herself. Um, And those of you working a 12-step program are probably thinking about steps eight and nine and how you forgive your mother if if she's been cruel and uh, left you with this legacy. And it's good to remember that um, forgiveness is for you. You can't always go back into relationship with her with that forgiveness because if she's not conscious of her behavior, she hasn't owned it. She may not be sorry, not be able to help you heal. The mothers that can never do this do require a a different type of letting go and forgiveness that might be a little bit different for your steps eight and nine. Okay, so that discussion for now is at a good stopping point, and I think we still have a good amount of time for questions, so I'm going to um, be quiet and listen to what you might have to say. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kelly. So this is from Sarah, and she asks if you have recommendations for resources for recovering addicts, male and female, to talk with their adult children about their recovery. Ah, well, my favorite resource for this is Dr. Stephanie Carnes. Um, And I'm really glad that the Center for Healthy Sex has already invited her to speak, so I would recommend that you watch her webinar. Um, She is really the expert on how to do that, and I learn from her. So um, you can find her words. She's also written books, but you can find her words on this website, and thank you for the Center of Healthy Sex for having her. Great. Um, From Mississippi, we have a question. When a mom is misguided in being too severe toward her daughter, can a grandmother fill that void through her grandmothering? Oh, yes, very much so, Um, especially if she is present enough. The beautiful thing about epigenetic imprinting is that it it extends to our grandmothers. So perhaps mother isn't capable of nourishing her daughter in this way. If there is a healthy grandmother to do this, the daughter is also going to be uh, benefiting from that grandmother's DNA, that grandmother's nervous system, it's also wired in. So, yes, definitely. Okay, Andrea uh, comments that she experiences both of the extremes of yearning for her mother and um, having no interest in connection. Well, I'm really glad that, that you mentioned that because I think you're highlighting the point that I make that this is a continuum and... Um, It's just not as simple or binary as being on one extreme or the other. So the fact that you feel both really makes a lot of sense to me, and I wonder if there's more of a question you have with that. Okay, and from Deborah, um, we have what could be happening with the switch in attachment style we see before marriage and then after marriage? Okay, I want to make sure I understand that question. What could be happening with the switch in attachment style before marriage and then after? Do you mean, I want to try to see if I understand what you mean, Deborah. Do you mean the the person who before marriage seems really anxiously attached, eager for relationship, and then the minute marriage happens, it's like, oh, no, I I don't really want this, and I don't want to be sexual, and I don't want to be close. Is Is that what you're talking about? She says yes, especially with men. Yeah, I see this a lot with men. I see it a whole lot with men, but it's really, 
I see it a lot with women as well. So, um, so really you've hit a, such an exquisite point of confusion and pain for many of our clients. Like, how is it that I can be so hungry for this relationship Then the minute I get it, I, I, I don't want to be sexual, I, I don't want to go there. And generally, when I find this happening, I look back to enmeshment with the mother that, especially for men, I would, I would, this is where I really like Ken Adams' work on silently seduced, um, all about emotional incest. Um, and for daughters, I work a lot for helping them understand that if their mother needed her in a way that felt kind of icky, that is unfortunately going to register in her body like incest, and so she's just going to shut down sexually as soon as she belongs to someone. So we have to go back and address that early enmeshment so that she can be available. I hope that helps. Thanks, Kelly. Um, Andrea says she doesn't know how to verbalize her questions yet about um, experiencing both of the extremes, but she does have another question. What are some resources for people who are incest survivors? Well, um, by resources, I, I mean, there are resources of things you could read. There are resources of clinicians. And, you know, the uh, work um, done 20 years ago, Courage to Heal and Allies in Healing is some of the best work. Wendy Maltz, I think, is one of the most prolific, generous, gentle authors and clinicians who writes specifically for incest survivors um, Anything Wendy Maltz has written, I would highly recommend for you. And then if you're interested in working clinically with someone, which I think is really important, I would work with someone that you feel safe with um, so you can regulate your brain and someone who's really trained in issues around sexual abuse and sexual addiction because most incest survivors are going to have some addictive relationship patterns. I hope that helps. Thanks, Kelly. Are there any more questions? We're almost at well, time, but I could um, I could turn the um, I could I could take a couple calls from uh, our phone. We have a lot of people that are just on phone, okay. so why don't we try opening up and we'll see how that goes. Uh, that'll just take a second. Oh, actually, I don't think I can do that. All attendees are oh. muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. So if you have a question, go ahead and, and press star six and you can ask it. Is there anyone that would like to ask any more questions? It's a great opportunity to sit down with an expert. <laughs> well, we're pretty much at the hour, so maybe this yeah. is a good stopping point. Uh, we have someone saying, was excited for your book being on Kindle. Thank you for today. And Lucy from Los Angeles would like to know, what are the neurological implications of sex love addiction? Well, how oh, lucky I have a... that Alex Katahakis is going to be writing that book, and it will be published soon. Right, Tom? Yeah, sex addiction is affect dysregulation. She's she's almost finished with it. She's hoping for a late 2000, early 2016 release. Fantastic. Fantastic. So stay tuned. Whatever Alex is going to publish about this, we are going to be so ready and grateful to have. And I really want to thank you for attending this topic today. Um, a lot of this is difficult to find language for and to talk about. So um, I appreciate you hanging in there. Anything else, Tom, before we close up? Um, yeah, I think someone on the phone wanted to ask a question. Okay. You're still there? I'm here. <laughs> the phone. I, I had a question. Oh. Is, is there sure. still time? Yeah, and, well, we can take another question. Um, I, I guess first I just wanted to acknowledge you, Kelly, that it just seems so divinely ordained or something that you are so focused on this topic because just listening to you and your voice and such, you are so gracious and kind and it's it's like 
healing the mother wound in me just being on the call with you. Oh, that warms me beyond words. What a gift for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, that it's very be, true. That would be my and hope. I guess my question is just, is there a workbook or something that you would recommend to a woman like we don't have the greatest sex and love addicts meetings in my area for women and so if I have a woman who's clearly a motherless woman and a sex and love addict something that she can because I have a woman now who's an engineer and she wants a program she wants like give me uh, a workbook I, I need to work on this understand. here's what I would suggest you can go to my website, kellymcdanieltherapy.com, and I uploaded, I, at one point I thought I was going to write a workbook. I didn't actually publish it, and instead I put up all the stuff I created onto my website. You can download it for free, print off the exercises that you would like, and there's stuff there about the four cultural beliefs, about mother hunger, about epigenetic imprinting. It's on my website, and you can print it off for free. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for your commentary. I really appreciate you for being here. Thank you. Great. And we have a comment that your book helped me take down my walls and see if my husband and I could restore our marriage. It's so very difficult, but the best thing I have ever done for myself, no matter the outcome. Um, maybe one last question. We have a question. How does being an adopted baby girl figure into the issues of mother hunger? Yes, exactly. That's, that, that fascinates me as well because there can be um, some really good mothering going on with the new um, adoptive parents, but so much of what a little girl internalizes, she also gets in utero. So depending on her birth mother's uh, conditions when she was in utero, she's still going to carry some of that uh, imprinting of her mother's nervous system into her life. So even if she has a fabulous new home and uh, she still could have some things to work with there that don't really seem to make sense and this could maybe shed potential light to look, to look at what she felt like when she was in the womb. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Any last words? like that's a great place to wrap up. Thank you so much, Tom, for facilitating. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Everyone at Center for Healthy Sex would like to thank you. You've, you've done so much for our organization, and, um, and I'm, I know that this webinar will really help a lot of people on YouTube, so I'm excited that, it's, that we had a chance to sit down with you today. Um, for everyone, our next webinar presenter uh, next month is going to be on June 12th. It's Hope Ray. She's in Michigan, and she's going to be talking about complex partner trauma, uh, your reaction, your partner's reaction to your sex addiction. So that should be very interesting. And I just wanted to remind you to, uh, if you want to, purchase our book, Mirror of Intimacy. Alexandra Katahakis and I just wrote this. It just won the uh, Book of the Year Award from American, from American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, which is a, a huge honor. So we're very happy about that. Um, I have a question that someone asked if you want to get copies of today's slides. So sure, you can just email me at tom at centerforhealthysex.com. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Kelly. That was be beautiful. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.